present is pregnant with the future, but this birth will have an audience. The specters of its past, those abortions that almost were, and the miscarriages of futures hoped for. This has been coming down the pike for a while, and is the culmination of my last 10 or so projects. It's winter, so here's the wintry milieu of our theory and my imaginary. Digital necromancy, cybernetic desire, the end of the future, the short circuit of death, and the absent real. I've invoked a lot of theorists this year, many of which offer trenchant criticisms of the state of this world, regardless of when they lived, and sometimes they offer ways out. Drearily, it feels like those ways out are becoming dead ends. It may be that these ghosts yet know the way, as the dead Tiresias return from the underworld to offer Odysseus the path home. Or perhaps they are, on the other hand, like old Hamlet, who would not rest until he was avenged. Do you believe in ghosts? I did say once to someone out there that I would never dress up and do skits because this isn't no Sesame Street ass YouTube philosophy channel, but that wasn't a skit. <laughs> that was an effect. Jacques Derrida, not a postmodernist. Nope. That, that Derrida writes by reading, you could say, or reads by writing. And while reading by writing, he's looking for ghosts. That is, partial presences. What's there but not fully there, fully present. We're talking about the specters, the traces, what is supplementary, what hides from or is hidden by even the most thorough philosophers who, on their way to constructing their grand systems of thought, forgot to notice these special crucial terms in their long-winded texts on the themes of being, history, structure in itself, or language. Hauntology now. All ontology is shadowed by a hauntology. The ghosts that are kind of there, but also not there. Here's your visual. Derrida is pretty clear, and this is from Spectres of Marx. Of every concept, beginning with the concepts of being in time, there is what we would be calling here a hauntology. Ontology opposes it only in a movement of exorcism. Ontology is a conjuration. So what's being exercised here is what we would call the repressed term, the term that is uh, considered supplementary or secondary. Woman is secondary to man. Poetry is secondary to philosophy. Nature is secondary to culture. And to sum them all up, Absence is secondary to presence. And the ghosts occur halfway between presence and absence. A ghost marks the absence that supplements the primary term. So again, to haunt does not mean to be present, and it is necessary to introduce haunting into the very construction of a concept. So quick example, philosophy purports to be about what is true and thus should be clear above all. Flowery or poetic language distracts from clear thought. Thus, philosophy earns its truth value only when purged of metaphoric expressions, unclear analogies, and so on. And as far as truth is concerned, is a lot more valuable than something like poetry. Hold up. You keep saying clear. What does that mean? Unambiguous, uh, not vague, easy to understand. So the term clear means clear in exactly the same way as having a clear view means clear. Yeah, just like this is clear and easy to see through, that's how we want our language to be, as opposed to vague terms, amb ambiguity, obfuscated, opaque, things like this. Wait, wait, wait. So even though you said no metaphors allowed, you're still describing the mechanisms of truth evaluation using a metaphor of vision. But I'm not using it metaphorically anymore. Now I'm using it literally. 
Gotcha! So, the central term of your whole definition of philosophy is now based on a metaphor transfer from a secondary discipline that you've ar arbitrarily excluded from your operational logic. Deconstructive. Okay, now that was a skit. <laughs> you can kill a term, but you can't exercise its ghosts. Deconstruction. But that's actually not what this video is about. It's about another kind of ghost. A different kind of specter. Marx is spectral, and there are many Marxes in the texts of Marxism, and more than one Marx in the YouTube videos on Marx. More than one Marx in the Twitter bios of Marxists. Sorry, Marxists. So what's up? In the early 90s, the state sophists declared that Marxism was dead and that he could now be buried in the cemeteries of the Union of Soviet Socialist Republics, and that we're now free to go about finishing history the American way. Derrida was quick to say, no, nah, this exorcism is gonna take a lot more than that, Fakiyama. <laughs> what is a ghost? What is the effectivity or the presence of a specter? That is, what remains to seem as ineffective, virtual, insubstantial as a simulacrum is there, there, between the thing itself and its simulacrum. This is Derrida's invocation that we're not done with Marx. We still need a critical politics, just like we're not done with God while we still need grammar. Finding the haunts of these not yet dead, not fully alive specters is whether or not you believe in hauntings, they are everywhere. Not least if you study the history of thought, or the histories of thought. The ultimate is that specter of a dead god which everywhere haunts the world and which he's been replaced, being replaced by these grinding, indifferent machines as the new background hum. That's some Weber. <laughs> what can we do with hauntology? Well, just because something's dead doesn't mean it knows it's dead. So there are at least two types of specter, according to me. One of the lost origin, which is commonly nostalgic, and the other of that aborted future that still cries out in vengeance, refusing to sleep. Uh, let's start begrudgingly with nostalgia. It's a drug, a stupid drug, a stupid pill. A pill to get back to the good old days. Symptoms of a lost state, even if it's a state that we never were in or had. Hmm, where have I heard that before? <laughs> the nostalgic dreams of utopia, or for a lost innocence, or a former coherence, before everything got so confusing. The haunt of utopia, oh, this is a perfect term too, because utopia literally means no place, didn't exist, can't exist, but not existing does not take away any of its efficacy. I remember an uncle of mine whom I loved very much. He lived by the sea and I often spent all day on the beach with him just walking along. He liked to smoke cigars. And each time he took one out, he asked me the same question. Do you like music? Yes, I'd say. Well then, here's a band for you. He put the Robert Burns band on my finger and we'd go on walking in the sun. Years later, that memory made me start smoking Robert Burns. Years later, that memory made me start smoking Robert Burns. Robert Burns. Robert Burns. Robert Burns. Revolutionaries and reactionaries alike hold utopia in their hearts. It haunts them. Even our own pasts, our childhoods, they haunt us as the good old days or a former source of unity meaning and innocence. And I am not the only one here who believes in hocus pocus. These are invokers and they'll say, we've lost real men. We've lost our values. We must fight for the soul of our country. Western civilization itself stands to be lost and is purity adulterated. If you're aiming it at a moral statement, then it's not art, it's propaganda. 
and it'll fall flat. Frozen was a good example. That was propagandistic right from the end to the beginning as far as I was concerned. That's his, his style. That's his, his own style. <coughs> I have no ready. Let me give me some time. Nostalgia is a bad trip, by the way. Values were always already phantasmic and invented. That's why they're called values. Then there's the second type of specter: the miscarried futures of the past. Perhaps injustice is never brought to justice. The evils of the past too continue to haunt right up to this minute. Abel's blood cries out from the ground, and the good old days were not everyone's good old days. Haunting's real. Marx's specters are of this second sort, and they continue to haunt while the contradictions that he pointed out remain. Inequality, economic oppression, debt, alienation. <laughs> Postmodernism, too, is hauntological. It spectralizes. Now, Derrida is not a postmodernist. <laughs> but he knows why postmodernism, if we want to call it that, is what it is. The medium of our specters is no longer the witch, the medium, but our ubiquitous necromantic machines. If this important frontier is being displaced, it is because the medium in which it is instituted, namely the medium of the media themselves, news, the press, telecommunications, the very possibility of the res publica, and the phenomenality of the political, this element itself is neither living nor dead, present nor absent. It spectralizes. Derrida. So this is a big deal. Media technology and digital technology, mobile recording, and the constant inundation of the less than present, these specters, is a big shift. Because truth was always mediated, yeah. But now it's also endlessly mediatable. So even the illusion of presence is a really rare thing. And not just for philosophers, but for everybody. Politics. The opposition between reality and specter was always somewhat fictitious in that one term secretly depended on the other. And that's what Derrida showed in the 60s. But now the decentering has been completed, though not by postmodernists or postmodern thought, but by these, by us and by me. The problem was for a young Derrida that philosophy, the metaphysics was far too focused on presence, that things were just straight up real, acceptable, there, even when they weren't. So the ghosts and spirits conjured by philosophers, the coherence of their images, their perfection, and their purity was a bleached and already idealized image. This is why nostalgia for the good old days, what goes in corrupted, is just the ghost of a simulacra. So the problem of the grand narrative, which was young Derrida's target for deconstruction, was a problem in the 60s. That's my opinion anyway. Old Derrida, right before he died, said something to the effect that de Boer had been right all along. Right about the spectacle, the society of the spectacle. Of so many ghosts conjured from every surface of every media machine. I, right now, to you, am a conjuration a ghostly absence or a ghostly presence on some machine. Even if I watch this video back, I'm a ghost to myself. Ghosts, 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 ghosts. Ghosts who don't know they're ghosts. This is not comforting, but it reflects deconstruction. And deconstruction was never meant to be comforting, sure, but it, now it's a way of life. And again, some like to blame postmodernism for that, but postmodernists, if any there be, are merely observers who reproduce the conditions of the spectralization. So, 
makes sense that there are many who long to return to Western civilization. But that's no longer a grand narrative. It's locked into its own self-sustaining loop. And similarly, there are those who long for the return of revolution, capital R, let's all overthrow capitalism. They're stuck in their own self-sustaining loop. Both symptoms of longing, loss, and fantasy because the time is out of joint. The time is out of joint. Advertisers figured this out. McDonald's figured this out. Now everything and everybody is an advertisement. Not for anything. They're an advertisement for themselves. Join my Patreon, by the way. Some of these Bruce Willis and Sixth Sense motherfuckers try to tell you that Western civilization is the product of Jerusalem and Athens. But no, this civilization is a product of San Francisco and Vegas, if anything. Our time is at a joint, carried along by an impure, impure history of ghosts. See, these specters of democracy, of Marxism, of Western culture, of God, were already impure. But now their impurity is also impure. We've seen through many of the former fantasies. What are these churches now if they are not the tombs and monuments of God? There never was a greater event. And on account of it, all who are born after us belong to a higher history than any history hitherto. But as goes God, fallen unconscious or whatever, so goes man under the spell of new gods. The market. Ghost market. Homeless. So, if you're ready to full circle, here's yet another ghost. The fate of our times is characterized above all by the disenchantment of the world. For civilized man, death has no meaning. It has none because the individual life of the civilized man placed into an infinite progress according to its own imminent meaning should never come to an end. For there is always a further step ahead of one who stands in the march of progress. Thus, and a specter is haunting capitalism. You can't kill what's already dead. So specters of simulacra and then specters of specters. At a time when a new world disorder is attempting to install its neo-capitalism and neoliberalism, no disavowal has yet managed to rid itself of all Marx's ghosts. Haunting belongs to the structure of every hegemony. So what do we do? Oh yeah, by the way, I forgot this. You're a ghost too, because the time is out of joint. As the archaeology of our thought shows, man is an invention of recent date, and one perhaps nearing its end, like a face drawn in the sand at the edge of the sea. Foucault. End of history. Sure, why not? It's always an end. Or rather, always ending. But ends are not complete, are they? Each end is haunted. And hauntology, if it's about anything, it's about that. So what to do? Watch the same movie over and over again, eternally? Or, thou art a scholar. Speak to it, Horatio. The time. Is that joint? Thou art a scholar. Speak to it. The time is out of joint. Thou art a scholar. Speak to it. <sighs> These ghosts. These are all ghosts. Who are you going to call when the sequel comes out? <laughs>